Torres Strait Island communities. It may contain images or voices of deceased persons. <laughs> And welcome to NOLA, a weekly program produced by the NITV news team. NOLA means here, there or everywhere in the Darug language and that's exactly where we'll take you as we check in with mob around the country for a look at the week's news from an Indigenous perspective. Coming up a bit later in the program, we'll celebrate our inspiring elders as we meet the 77-year-old blues singer set to perform at a Perth festival this weekend and the Nut and Jerry Nanners singing to preserve their language and their culture. most important message that we can get out to our Aboriginal community is how much power singing in your language and learning your language is to your soul. That story for you soon, but first, family and friends are mourning the loss of Dungadi teenager Jai Wright, who died in Sydney on the weekend after an interaction with police. His family is calling for a truly independent investigation into his death. A grieving family coming to terms with the tragedy that took their son's life. Jai, Jai Wright was our 16-year-old son and brother, grandson, nephew, cousin. Um, he was a bright and lively boy. The ordeal began at 7am when police cited what they believed were two stolen vehicles in the inner city suburb of Alexandria. 35 minutes later, it ended when the bike collided with an unmarked police car at an intersection. Jai suffered serious injuries after he was ejected from the motorbike. He went to school just down the road from here at International Grammar. Finished year 10 last year and started an electrician's apprenticeship. He's not going to be able to finish that. Police maintain there was no pursuit, but the family isn't convinced with police rejecting their request to access their notes and footage of the incident. As a family, we don't understand why the police have used so much force to stop a 16-year-old boy. We have been given inconsistent information by police as to what caused Jai's death. Any parent wants to know how their little boy has died. That is why we are calling for an entirely independent inquiry away from the police so that we get to know why our boy and how our boy died. A critical investigation has been launched into the incident. It will be independently reviewed, but the family are saying Jai's death must be treated as a death in custody. The community has rallied together, a family left devastated and seeking answers. All I know is from a parent, being a parent, that's my kid, I'm never going to see him again after today. You know, I just want to know the truth. You know, wherever the truth leads us, let's... his brothers, his sisters, like, we're just, all our family, we just want to know the truth and then um, we'll, we'll be fine with that. Michele Siren, NITV News. The murder trial of a Northern Territory policeman who shot and killed an Aboriginal teenager in a remote community in 2019 will run it into a fourth week. And a quick warning, some of the footage we're about to show is confronting and some viewers may find it distressing. Biomechanics expert Dr Andrew McIntosh told the jury, in his opinion, Kuman Jay Walker posed a low risk to Constables Zachary Rolfe and Adam Eberl as he wrestled with Officer Eberl on a mattress after being shot by Constable Rolfe during an attempted arrest. Dr McIntosh said Kuman Jay Walker had limited movement of his right arm as Officer Eberl applied downwards force during the struggle. Constable Rolfe has pleaded not guilty to murder and two lesser charges. The trial continues on Monday. There's rising concern about the spread of COVID-19 in remote communities in Western Australia. 
The community of Bijidanga, 180 kilometres south of Broome, went into lockdown yesterday after recording 17 cases of the virus. The Kimberley Aboriginal Medical Service has sent in a rapid response team to help with the testing and vaccination efforts. WA Premier Mark McGowan says he expects more infections will be detected in the community in the coming days. Still in the west, an Anungar elder facing eviction from her home in Perth's southeastern suburbs has been given a reprieve. The grandmother fell foul of Western Australia's harsh no grounds eviction policy, meaning tenants can be forced out of their homes through no fault of their own. After NITV inquiries, the Aboriginal Housing Corporation has now extended her lease. Auntie Joan Woods is rejoicing after receiving news she won't be evicted from her home in Beaconsfield tomorrow. I'm feeling very happy and um, yeah, I didn't expect it. I'm just ready to you know, walk out the door tomorrow. The Noongar grandmother has lived in this small unit within the Manjabuja housing village. It's supposed to provide safe and culturally appropriate affordable housing for elders in the community. But late last year, Joan received an eviction order and she's been preparing to leave. I've been so unwell. I've given calls and telling me that the owners want me to get out. And I, I didn't, know, didn't know how to react because I never drank in my life. I never smoked a cigarette or... I didn't know what gun you was in my day. The eviction notice came as a shock to her and her family. The risk of being homeless put the Noongar elder under further strain, but she wasn't giving in. Aboriginal people, we were, you know, live together and pull together, you know, fight together, march together. But this is completely different to what I've known all my life. Family and friends have rallied around Auntie Joan and they say she should have never have been threatened with eviction. She's a, of good character, she doesn't drink, smoke, uh, anything like that. Uh, yeah, and she's a family lady, she loves her relatives, and goes and visits and comes and sees us in her yard. Joan's situation is far from rare and thousands of Western Australians are at risk of eviction under the strict regime. No Grounds Eviction has been around um, for as long as I've known. It's it's quite a, a strict rule. Um, the only leeway it gives is it, it does give a tenant an extra 60 days to find a place. But in a market like today's market, um, 60 days is, is neither here nor there. They've, often tenants have nowhere to go. NITV has been told the Manjabuja Aboriginal Corporation chairperson, Rochelle Hume, has this week stepped down from her position after a seven-year tenure. In a statement today regarding letting Miss Wood stay in the premises for a further four months, the body said our tenants are our elders. Manjabuja Aboriginal Corporation understands they deserve our respect and ongoing support. For Joan, it's a welcome and desperately needed reprieve. Otherwise I think we're just going in a home, you know, elders' home. That was my last option. I didn't get a place. So that's time. I've got time. Karen Cox, NITV News. A new Indigenous political party has announced some of its candidates who will run at the next federal election. The Indigenous People's Party was set up by Barkindji Malangapa man Owen Wyman and officially registered in November. At a launch in Queensland this morning, he announced candidates who will campaign on a range of issues, including the protection of country employment, education, housing and justice. I think it's, it's very, very important to have an Indigenous party. I know we do have Indigenous people representing different parties in, in Parliament, but they're held accountable to what they can do or say. By having our own party, we can um, set our goals, you know, the, the sky's the limit. I was involved in another party, uh, but as you may appreciate, when you, whatever party you're in, you, you are governed by their policies, but um, there's a big difference in having our own Indigenous party and our own policies that's addressed, really addressing all of our issues. 
After a quarter of a century of lobbying, a paved road through Australia's desert has finally been given the green light. The road runs through the vast federal seat of Lingiari in the Northern Territory, an electorate where nearly half of the voters are Indigenous. And it could play a crucial role in deciding who wins government. A desert road trip dream. Out back way, signs yeah. here on the Now a reality after 25 years of lobbying. We're fixing problems for communities and people and their livelihoods and their lifestyle. The Outback Way is almost 3,000 kilometres of gravel and bitumen between Winton in Queensland and Laverton in WA. Once it's fully paved, there will be tar on top of the road, all the way from Perth to Townsville. We're only now building our third sealed road across the nation, should have happened years ago. The coalition's been in power for close to a decade and made some inroads with the states and territories, now promising $678 million in the next 10 years to finish the job. At the moment, parts of the road are in serious disrepair. If you can picture going through Bulldust where this whole triple road train disappears, um, and it's full of livestock. And those in training for working on cattle stations are also likely to benefit, like Sharice, who's hoping one day to run a station herself. As a young Indigenous woman, I think it's important for the younger generation to um, have eyes open and just see that there are other opportunities. The money not just promised, but now written into the federal budget. We understand that Labor will co has committed to honour uh, any of the funding that has already been allocated to this project. This is a part of Australia that's often misunderstood and neglected by policymakers, but now it's in play and some political insiders believe a seat like this could determine who holds government. That's something that locals believe is a good thing because at least this electorate is now in the spotlight and that could lead to positive change. Well, last weekend we paused to remember the day war came to Australian shores. 80 years ago, on February 19th, 1942, Japan launched a surprise attack, the biggest by a foreign power in our country's history. A dramatic reenactment. The surprise air raids remembered in the top end capital 80 years on. The city, the nation was in shock. The memories seared into the minds of the survivors. Brian Winspear was a Royal Australian Air Force pilot. It was a day he will never forget. I can still see the pilot's face. I can still see the, the sun glinting off the bombs coming straight down, looking straight up and, the, and the directly up there. That, that, all the bombs are aiming at me. The day started like any other taking a turn just after 10 o'clock as the first wave of bombers attacked ships anchored in the harbour. They didn't fly straight from straight into, into Darwin. They went a back way right around the circle and came in from the south. And so no, nobody worried about them because they were sure they were American, you know, bombers. For Darwin's traditional owners, the Larrakia people, the event meant the morning of country. Richard Fijo spent his childhood seeing the scars of war peppered across Darwin, regularly finding shrapnel and empty bullet casings hidden along the shoreline. We bled together, we died together, we fought together, but we did that as one. And that's why it's important to carry this over in reconciliation today. There are calls for this day to be made a national public holiday. Darwin stands as a reminder to all of the painful cost of war, wherever it plays out. Preserving the memory of this tragic event for generations to come. Anita Bole for NITV. They're the Nutanjeri women singing to preserve their language. Known as the Deadly Nanas, they'll be performing at Adelaide's Fringe Festival this weekend, and they're hoping to spread messages of love and empowerment. Song and Survival. The Deadly Nanas established to keep alive their Nutanjeri language and culture through music. We've got all the, this CD, we've got these songs. It'd be great to 
you know, share it with our community. We thought we'd become the Deadly Nanas and go around and sing these songs to, you know, schools and stuff. For the past seven years, Naragi Mutha, as they are known in the Nanajeri language, have been singing about love and cultural identity in both their First Nations language and English. churches to festivals and schools. They write and perform their own songs. Several of the Nutanjeri women in the group grew up speaking Nutanjeri at home, but were not permitted to do so anywhere else. Now they're reviving the language and passing it on. And I've, Since my 20s I've been mentoring younger fellas as well, so being able to do that and teach them the language. The most important message that we can get out to our Aboriginal community is how much power singing in your language and learning your language is to your soul. While another core message is reconciliation. We've got two Krinkri Marawas and they're two white sisters who um, sing with us because we want to show people in the community that if we can build bridges, if we can, you know, have that reconciliation and build bridges, we want the community to do that. Love and respect. Yeah. That's yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's for, for, for everyone in the group. Yeah. 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 A love of performing combined with the awareness and ultimate knowledge that comes with connection to culture through song. Other groups that I've been in, it doesn't feel the same. So it's, it's made my spirit stronger. It's made me just feel better, you know, in myself. So definitely it's a family. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> Deadly Nanas will perform two shows this weekend at the Adelaide Fringe Festival. Pasco oh. Braun, NITV News. <laughs> what a great story. Time for a break now, but when we come back, a second shot at glory. We'll catch up with singer Isaiah Firebrace as he vies to represent Australia at Eurovision once again. <laughs> The action, undemanding. The ordinary, unbelievable. The experience, unparalleled. Unwind with stunning landscapes from across Australia. Barme, tonight at six on NITV and On Demand. You never forget the dogs you've loved. The puppy that first stole your heart. The companion who grew with you. The friend who stayed by your side through the best times and the worst. You never forget the love, a love without words, made of touch and play and perfect trust. You never forget what it means to rely on each other completely. And because you understand how a dog can change a life, will you help change someone else's life? With a gift to guide dogs in your will. A guide dog is more than a beloved companion and friend. These incredible dogs transform lives. For someone living with sight loss, your gift could mean love, opportunity, and freedom. To do something wonderful with your will, send for your free guide on how you can include a gift to guide dogs, and we will send you a magnetic picture frame as a thank you. Please call 1-800-940-608 or search online for Guide Dogs Remember. And remember the dogs you've loved when you leave a gift in your will to guide dogs. When you choose Allianz Comprehensive Car Insurance, you can choose to save on your premium by simply increasing your basic excess. Search Allianz Car Insurance to get your quote today. With 25 years of hybrid electric and fuel cell innovation, it's in our nature to strive for a cleaner tomorrow. Oh, what a feeling. Toyota. Hooray! Woo! 
It's all downhill from here, Gary. Too right, though. We're not getting any younger. Are you covered if something happens to you? Ooh. Gary? Come on, buddy. We've all got to face it eventually, Gaz. It's good to be prepared. We can see you, Gary. Insurance line, here for the heavy stuff. Those who would make an enemy of the Lord will pursue into the dark realm. He is fury. He is wrath. He is vengeance. <gasps> but the righteous shall rejoice when they see the vengeance. They will bathe his feet in the blood of the wicked. Welcome back. Well, for the first time, this year's Sydney Gay and Lesbian Mardi Gras Fair Day featured an Indigenous theme. Our reporter, Maddie Mills, went along to check it out. The Mardi Gras Festival has well and truly kicked off with Fair Day, an event for community pride and celebration leading the way. The event kicked off with a special welcome to country and electric performances by the Black Divas. Black, in conjunction with Sydney Gay and Lesbian Mardi Gras, will host its first First Nation Circle to amplify Indigenous voices and also to host workshops. First Nation! All year round it's important to acknowledge that First Nations people are always um, really driving the narrative around what is affecting us and by us. I want to acknowledge that black was really a first step at self-determination and actually taking up space and we recognise that you know everybody wants to talk about our community during Mardi Gras but it's every other day that counts. It's all year round for people that are being challenged about their identity, for people that are looking to you know have access to health um, and housing and education. Black has programmed a number of events throughout the festival, including Koori Gras on the 25th and 26th of February. What does Mardi Gras mean to you? Um, I think it means freedom, like the ability to come together um, and express sexuality in a safe space. It's about people coming together for a common cause and like showcasing the, uh, I guess, great things and the diversity within the community as well, yeah. Well, I reckon one of our highlights is having Maddie Mills in the magazine this year. I noticed that you picked up the Maddie Mills story. That was a highlight. That's been good. Why don't we have a look? Let's, let's have a look at Maddie Mills in here. There he is. This year's theme is United We Shine, and that is truly here on display today. I'm Maddie Mills, reporting for NITV News. Well, Australia returns to the polls tomorrow night, not for an election, but to decide who should represent us at Eurovision this year. Among the contenders is Yorta Yorta and Gunditch Mara singer Isaiah Firebrace, who's hoping to perform at the International Song Contest for a second time. He recently sat down for a yarn with Living Black's Carla Grant. It seems like you're returning to where it almost all began, contesting Eurovision, this time on Eurovision Australia Decides. Yep. Why are you trying again? Why am I trying again? Uh, well, I did have the opportunity to go in 2017 uh, to the Ukraine to represent Australia, which was like the best experience ever. And now being 22, a little bit older, I just kind of wanted to just show everyone how, how much I've grown and and also showcase my artistry a bit more with the song that I have. Um, it's a song that I wrote. It's been announced that you'll be singing a duet with singer Evie Irie. So the song is a collaboration between myself and Evie and we, we wrote this song together in a songwriting session like last year, early, early last year. I want to be that guy, let me do you right, grab you by your waist, take you out tonight. So tell us a bit more about the song itself and the lyrics. It's a song about, you know, like being with that special someone that makes you feel, like, awesome. Um, and also, it kind of has a bit of elements of, like, this whole COVID experience and, like, not being able to be with the close to the ones that, that 
you love, so it's kind of got that kind of aspect to it. Now you're going to be up against 10 other artists. How do you rate your chances of um, getting through? <laughs> How do I rate my chances? Because um, you've got Paulini and you know, Paulini. he's quite well known. Like we're good friends. We Every time we're with each other, we have a good laugh and joke around. And... Will you be friends that night though? <laughs> yes, of course. I told her, I'm like, I'm so keen to hear you just smash it. How do I rate my chances? I don't know. I don't think about this stuff going into this. <laughs> I worry about me. I worry about the task at hand for myself. I think I'm my biggest competition. To be back on that stage sharing music with an amazing artist and putting a song out there that I really love is all I'm looking forward to. And if we make it to Italy, like, that would be sick. Thank you so much, yeah! And you can watch that full interview with Isaiah Firebrace tomorrow night at 8 o'clock on NITV. That's right before Eurovision Australia Decides on SVS and NITV. And a concert that celebrates the living culture, stories and songs of Western Australia's West Pilbara returns to Perth this weekend. The Songs for Freedom concert is the culmination of a community program that began 10 years ago in the small community of Roeburn. <laughs> Last year's inaugural Songs for Freedom concert in Perth was a huge success and blues artist Kankawa Nagara Knight was one of the star performers. The renowned singer-songwriter mixes blues and gospel music in both English and mid Kimberley Creole, but she didn't have a guitar of her own until she was 40. It was a passion of mine for a long time, I wanted to just take, get hold of the guitar, but um, the problem was that in my culture, you couldn't touch uh, an instrument that, that, that a man was using. The first concert was a long time in the making. All the songs that featured were written by the Iramugadu community of Roeburn, on country, in the town and in prisons. It's part of a healing program that began with community workshops 10 years ago. Yaru and Wajiri performer Naomi Pegram has been part of the program for the past three years. And I feel very privileged um, to be able to go into someone else's community and, and help, um, help people put their um, stories down. And in the lead up to this weekend's concert, the songwriting workshops are continuing in Perth. So how, what will the next verse be? Grammy Award winning performer Lucky Oceans is the program's musical director and was the one that got Kankawa involved. Kankawa's music is so vital and her, her belief in social change is so on the surface that I thought that brought something to the project as well. Yes, I'd like to change politics with my lyrics and um, I've written a song called Canning Bass and Blues which, which sort of more or less is a, is a political um, uh, drive of mine to stop fracking up in my country. At 77, Kankawa says she wants to keep playing for as long as she can and hopes to be back for the concert again next year. Look, well, now my age um, supports me or, or allows me, hopefully I'll go on to the 80s and beyond. <laughs> And those are just a few of the stories the NITV News team covered this week. I'm Natalie Armat. We'll see you next week. The